uh, Professor uh, Webke is Assistant Professor and Consultant of Anesthesiology at Ohio University. And she is going to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Walid Hamimi. Uh, please, Dr. Webke. I can handle Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, I would just like to thank Dr. Ashraf Al Tayyar for this previous lecture, which was very interesting. And uh, we should always get excited about um, things we can do for our patients that have such minimal risk and are just so, so potentially so beneficial uh, for the management of our patients. So I'd like to move on uh, to the next presenter. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Professor Walid Ibrahim Himami. He is from the University of Cairo. He is a professor of anesthesia, surgical intensive care and pain management. He's been very, uh, very active in the science community. He has been editor in chief of uh, the Egyptian Journal of Anesthesia, just as an example. And he's going to be talking to us today uh, about um, anesthesia in bariatric surgery. Go ahead, Dr. Himami. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this uh, nice presentation. And I want to thank Dr. Saad for allowing me to share in this course. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Ansari and Dr. Ashraf for their nice presentations. Then in the next 35 minutes, I will talk about the anesthesia for bariatric surgery. My main objectives include the prevalence of obesity in Egypt, and it's a problem worldwide, as you all know and who is the high-risk obese. Uh, also, I will highlight some points on enhanced recovery after bariatric surgery, including the role of counseling and patient education and rehabilitation risks. Obesity is one of the, uh, one of the most challenging public health problems today. In Egypt, according to the CIA World Factbook, the prevalence of obesity is uh, around 35%. And as our population is reaching more than 100 million, uh, then we have 35 million persons that are obese. It's, it's more in females, it's double the males, and it has higher uh, prevalence in the population of lower income. Um, this is uh, our ranking. Uh, actually, we are not the, uh, we don't have the most prevalent, but we have the uh, largest number in the Arabian countries. Um, who is the high-risk obese patient? The operative risk of the bariatric surgical candidate may be divided into several categories according to the patient characteristics, the medical conditions, and some surgical factors. As regards patient characteristics, the age and gender, uh, nowadays we are dealing with uh, older patients, older obese patients, and age due to the comorbidities that are more common in the elderly, uh, we are facing more uh, morbid patients. Also, the body mass index is one of the factors. Sedentary lifestyle of most of the obese patients and the higher prevalence of smoking in such patients. The medical conditions, including cardiovascular disease and hypertension, diabetes, hypercoagulability, and pulmonary disease, as well as the surgical factors that include the type of the procedure, whether malabsorptive procedure or a restrictive procedure for the mixed type. The liver size also add in the difficulty of the uh, surgical uh, procedure. One of the most important points that uh, should be considered is the surgeon volume or, or the number of patients that the surgeon had uh, performed. Uh, of course, more experienced surgeons, more large volume surgeons will uh, have easier or, and less complicated surgeons. What is enhanced recovery after surgery? By definition, it refers to the de uh, to develop clinical pathways that are patient-centered and that are evidence-based and involving a multidisciplinary team. 
The targets of enhanced recovery is to reduce the patient's surgical stress response and to optimize the physiological response and also to facilitate the recovery. Facilitating the recovery doesn't mean fast track only, but to enhance the return of the patient to his preoperative functional states. Actually, it's a journey starting from the first visit of the patient to the clinic, followed by the preoperative uh, period, including the preoperative assessment and optimization, the surgery and the anesthesia, and the postoperative uh, period, the ward stay in the hospital and at home. These three uh, points are the recovery that's that's we mean by enhancement of this recovery and not the fast or the duration of surgery that is involved in enhancing of recovery. The interactive team audit for outcomes and compliance is one of the important points that some of us miss during implementation of the protocol for enhanced recovery as auditing will improve the performance and improve the outcomes of our patients. Some of the points that are considered in bariatric surgery in the preoperative period are counseling, the prehabilitation, uh, there's no need for bowel preparation, no prolonged fasting, the fluid and carbohydrate intraoperatively, the short acting anesthetics, the multimodal analgesia, the use of epidural or the regional uh, trunkal uh, uh, anesthesia or analgesia. Uh, also, in the post-operative period, the prevention of nausea and vomiting, starting preoperatively or intraoperatively, the use of non-opioid analgesia or less opioid analgesia, to, to, uh, to be more accurate, less opioid analgesia, early mobilization and early drinking. In the preoperative uh, points of the enhanced recovery, counseling and patient education plays an important role. Uh, in preoperative education include the scheduling, scheduling of education early and the increased frequency of message exposures through several interventions. The content of these messages should frequently address the postoperative management in order to educate the patient about the problems that he might face in the postoperative period. What is prehabilitation? Prehabilitation is the process of care starting before surgery. Its, its aim is to strengthen the physical, nutritional, medical, and mental status of the patient in order to face the surgical insult and facilitate the postoperative return to the preoperative condition or status. The program consists of preoperative baseline medical assessment and evaluation of physical strength and flexibility nutrition and mental health. The organ system based approach for preoperative assessment includes medical and surgical history, and this is of extreme importance, as well the activity level and quality of life. As one of the most important points that we should check preoperatively is the functional capacity of the patients, and I will discuss this later. Physical examination, including the chest, heart, lung, and uh, uh, every every medical point of, uh, of um, importance in such patients. The investigations that are needed for these patients, and lastly, the as the organ system reserve assessment. Prehabilitation simply equals maximum optimization. Optimization of the condition of the patient to the maximum possible in order to have better outcome. It's a personalized program that is prepared based on the medical and pharmacological condition of the patient, aerobic and resistance exercises, protein and energy supplementation, anti-anxiety strategies, glycemic control, and alcohol and smoking cessation. The prehabilitation program shortens the recovery and accelerates the return to the preoperative conditions. In the preoperative period, we should stratify our risk, our, stratify our patients according to their risk, and there are general risk classification scores that are 
one of the examples is the POSIM score, the physiological and operative severity scoring for the evaluation of mortality and morbidity. And this includes 12 physiological variables and six surgical variables. Another, another score is the LEES, LEES uh, reverse cardiac risk index, which is commonly used for cardiac patients uh, coming for non-cardiac surgery. Uh, the most specific for obese patients is, which has been validated recently, the obesity surgery mortality risk score, which includes the following five factors, which are the, arter sorry, the arterial hypertension, the age, which is more than 45 years, male gender, the body mass index of more than 50 kilograms per square meter, the risk factors for pulmonary thromboembolism. The low risk patients would have one zero to one score, and the high risk would have four to five score. The functional capacity assessment, this is measured in metabolic equivalence. A one met equals the basal metabolic rate at rest. The, our patients should, should have uh, four mets at least, which in which indicates climbing one flight of stairs while swimming or playing tennis demand is for more than 10 mets. The inability to perform four mets indicates poor functional capacity and is associated with an increased incidence of post-operative cardiac events. As we have said, enhanced recovery after surgery involves several, uh, several points to be considered. One of them is the preoperative fasting. Clear fluids are allowed for up to two hours before surgery and solids for six hours before uh, induction of anesthesia in healthy and obese patients. But patients usually come to the hospital fasting for more than six hours. In this case, the extra fasting hours are calculated and the patient is infused with sodium containing crystalloids, usually Ringer's uh, balance of the solution, uh, to avoid may lead to induction, uh, post-induction of anesthesia hypertension. This is a very important issue as we have problem in the time scheduling of our, of our operations and patients usually come fasting from midnight and their operation is at 2 p.m. or 4, 3 p.m. That means the, is 15 hours fasting, 15 hours fasting even for clear fluids indicates that he's hypovolemic post-induction. We commonly see hypotension that is due to the hypovolemia, due to the long fasting hours. Another point of extreme importance is the carbohydrate loading, or in other words, the preoperative carbohydrate condition. Carbohydrate loading includes clear fluids that are allowed up to two hours prior to induction of anesthesia. It is recommended for or for all elective surgeries and some emergency surgeries. Getting fluids containing complex carbohydrates can enable patients to undergo surgery in a, metabolic, in a metabolically fed state. This has been explained in a nice review presented in Anesthesia Intensive Care titled Nutritional Prehabilitation, in which preoperative carbohydrate loading leads to an increased insulin this increased insulin will, will do two things. It will inhibit face prote acute face protein cytokines and, and will stimulate the insulin receptor substrate. This the insulin receptor substrate activation will decrease the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase for expression, leading to reduction of muscle inflammation, reduction of the catabolic state that happens postoperatively, and the inhibition of the acute phase protein cytokines will lead to decreased insulin resistance. Therefore, carbohydrate loading leads to attenuation of the development of post-operative insulin resistance and the reduction of post-operative nitrogen and protein losses, as well as maintenance of the lean body mass. Perioperative fluid management represents a real challenge and optimizing fluid management in such patients is very important. Why? Why is it a challenge? Because of the physiological differences between the obese and the non-obese, the multiple comorbidities that, that is associated with obesity, 
the inaccuracies with non-invasive monitoring and also the higher incidence of rhabdomyolysis. And I will uh, stress on this point uh, a bit later. In the obese patient, the total blood volume is increased despite a reduced blood volume on volume, to weight, volume over weight basis. This means that the obese patient has a blood volume of 50 milliliter per kg instead of 75 milliliter per kg for the non-obese, but with a higher total blood volume. Rhabdomyolysis defined is defined as elevation in the serum creatinine kinase of more than 1,000 international units. Its rate is not uncommon, even in laparoscopic surgery, but in the prolonged laparoscopic surgery. It reaches up to 77% in some uh, papers presented in the literature. The risk factors for rhabdomyolysis is male sex, body mass index of more than 52 kilograms per square meter, and operation times more than four hours. To avoid rhabdomyolysis by, uh, by, by fluid therapy, liberal fluid, the liberal fluid therapy is indicated in such patients. But in a study of, of the effect of volume of fluids, administered on intraoperative oliguria in laparoscopic bariatric surgery uh, in March 12, in uh, 2012, there was no difference in the intraoperative urine output noted when morbidly obese patients were randomized to receive either 4 milliliter per kg per hour or 10 milliliter per kg per hour volumes of vinegar lactate. Another study that proved that the fluid therapy should not be the liberal type is the, that uh, Indian study presented on obesity surgery journal in 2010, in which they used stroke volume variation as a guide to fluid administration in the morbidly obese patients undergoing laparoscopic bariatric surgery. And the mean amount of fluid infused in these patients was duration of surgery. All patients were maintained uh, maintain their hemodynamic parameters. And they concluded that obese patients coming for laparoscopic bariatric surgery may not require excessive fluids, and that intraoperative fluid requirement is the same as for the non-obese patients. One of the most important issues in also in enhanced recovery after bariatric surgery is the prophylaxis against postoperative nausea and vomiting. But why, especially in bariatric surgery? Because all of the criteria that AFIL has, pro has proposed for the uh, higher incidence of, of, for the incidence of nausea and vomiting are fulfilled in our patients. As most of our patients are females, most, most of them are less than 50 years of age, non-smokers, and receiving post-operative opioid analgesia. And in some centers, laparoscopic procedures for bariatric surgery uh, takes more than one hour in duration. For prophylaxis against nausea and vomiting, a multimodal approach should be uh, considered, including propofol for induction and maintenance of anesthesia, avoidance of volatile anesthetics, minimization of intra and post operative opioids, optimization of the fluid therapy, and lastly, prophylactic anti emetics. Of the groups of anti-emetics used, the, the 5-hydroxytryptamine receptor antagonists, corticosteroids, especially dexamethasone, butyrophenones, neurokinin-1 receptor antagonist, antihistaminics, and anticholinergics. This study has proposed that uh, the combination of haloperidol, dexamethasone, and ondansetron for prevention of post-operative nausea and vomiting uh, presented a superiority against other uh, um, anti-emetics and against other combinations of anti-emetics. Dexamethasone not only reduces the post-operative nausea and vomiting, but also reduces the stress response by its anti-inflammatory properties, decreases the complication rate, complications rates of the operations, and decreases the length of stay. It is recommended in a dose of 2.5 to 5 milligram intravenously, but to be considered 
timing is very important. 90 minutes prior to surgery. This is very important as we usually, as a common practice, we add dexamethasone with induction of anesthesia in the infusion that is given to the patient. But this is not actually effective for the nausea and vomiting special. It is. It may be. It may help for the stress response. It may help for the adjuvant to the analgesia, but not for the nausea and vomiting. Uh, another drug that should be given 90 minutes prior to surgery is the intravenous acetaminophen or paracetamol, that should be given before surgery 90 minutes to have a better effect as an adjuvant or as a part of the multimodal analgesia that I will talk about later. Thromboprophylaxis is also very important in such patients as thromboembolic complications represent the main cause of morbidity and 50% of the mortalities that happen after bariatric surgery. Of the risk factors in such patients is the obesity itself, the history of venous thromboembolism, smoking, which is not which is common in such population, heart failure, obstructive sleep apnea, as well as estrogen oral contraception. How to do thromboprophylaxis? As the common saying that we use, uh, early stockings, late heparin. The mechanical methods should be used starting pre-induction, including the intermittent pneumatic compression, graduated compression stockings, calf length compression stockings, and lastly, the early mobilization post-operative. As for pharmacotherapy, we have two options, either to use low molecular weight heparin or arm fractionated heparin, but there is a superiority of low molecular weight heparin due to its many advantages, including the more predictive, predictable dose response, the increased bioavailability, the longer plasma half-life after subcutaneous injections, allowing once daily dosing, which is more suitable for the patients, or more, more uh, easy. easy. There is different such as thrombocytopenia and osteoporosis with long-term use. <coughs> the recommended doses that, I, that we usually use in, in our centers is the use of enoxaparin 8 to 12 hours after surgery, after uh, ensuring that the patient is not hypertensive and or his blood pressure is being very well controlled and that there is no <clears throat> internal bleeding. The use is once daily, 6,000 units, according to the body mass index, 6,000 units for the, body, for the BMI of more than 30. For the patients who are more than 40, uh, 8,000 units and for body mass indices of more than 50, 10,000 units are sufficient. These doses have been shown to be safe without any increased risk of bleeding. A common, a common problem is the post-operative oxygenation, especially in the obstructive sleep apnea patients. Therefore, we have to screen all of our patients preoperatively for the presence of obstructive sleep apnea, as 30% of these patients are, have undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea. The, the, the validated questionnaire, the, 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 thing, the questionnaire that we use is the stop bank questionnaire that includes snoring, S for snoring, T for tiredness, O for observed, observed uh, apnea or observed sleeping, P for the blood pressure, bang is the body mass index, age, neck, and gender, and having a score of more of less than three in, indicates a low risk of obstructive sleep apnea and a score of more than three having a high risk of obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, patients without obstructive sleep apnea usually do not need routine incentive spirometry and it it's, it's, uh, depends on um, um, individual, uh, to be considered individually according to the patient condition post -op. Also, epidural catheters are very important to help pain relief, especially in open bariatric surgery in which there is limitation of the uh, respiration by the uh, long uh, midline scar uh, incisions. 
patients with obstructive sleep apnea, these patients with moderate to high risk of obstructive sleep apnea you know, are indicated to have a CPAP uh, mask or BiPAP mask according to their condition. Also, continuous pulse oximetry and respiratory rate are very important in these patients. Who is the patient who is in need of CPAP non-invasive ventilation? The obese who is undiagnosed obstructive sleep apnea. The patients with obstructive sleep apnea is, who is not using CPAP, patients using uh, obstructive sleep apnea using CPAP home therapy, and lastly, patients with obesity hypoventilation syndrome. The patient-related factors indicated the increased need of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation use are the moderate to severe OSA, the male gender, ages more than 50 years, EMI is more than 60, pulmonary comorbidity, and the need for uh, reoperation. Oxygen saturation. Any patient with oxygen saturation below 90% in the immediate post-operative period is defined as hypoxic and indicates the need of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. This non-invasive positive pressure ventilation includes the CPAP or BiPAP, and recently the high flow nasal oxygen that uh, have a similar effect as the CPAPing of such patients. The liberal use of non-invasive post positive pressure ventilation therapy should also be considered in the presence of any tachypnic and hypercarbic patients. As for multimodal analgesia, uh, by definition, it indicates the simultaneous administration of two or more analgesic agents targeting pain pathways at various levels. It is used to improve pain control, and aim to, its aim, main aim is to reduce the opioid utilization and its related adverse effects, in, especially in our group of patients, which are the obese patients that are more sensitive to the opioids. It includes the use of systemic analgesic, analgesic starting by intravenous paracetamol, acetaminophen, short-acting opioids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, then IV receptors, magnesium and ketamine, the local anesthetics IV, the xylocaine, dexamethasone, and lastly, the most effective of them is the use of dexmedetomidine intraoperatively as a pseudo-analgesic or as an adjuvant to the analgesia and anesthesia during the, uh, in the post-operative. Analgesia is, analgesia is very important. The use of epidural or spinal uh, opioid morphine, the use of tap block and the use of erector spinal plane block also, uh, also have been studied in such patients in order to reduce the use of post-operative opioids in the first 24 hours. Lastly, local infiltration of incision sites. I want to stress on the point that pre-incision, local infiltration of incision site, we should wait for three to four minutes and not as the usual uh, practice that they are doing in, in surgeries today. They inject the local anesthetic and then they stab the patient. It seems a problem from internet, so... Um, I can hear you, Dr. Saad. Yeah, okay. So, most probably, um, some, what happened exactly, I believe there is internet interruption from this side, from my side, which lead to disruption of the whole uh, webinar. So, my sincere apology, most probably, properly has finished already. Yes, uh, are you ready for some questions? Okay. Yes, sure, sure. So there is uh, uh, one person that is asking uh, about the use of dexamethasone and uh, patients that have diabetes. Can you comment on that? Okay, a single dose of dexamethasone will lead to an increase in, in the blood sugar just for the three to five hours, but already these patients are being controlled by insulin in the post-operative period. Uh, for, for we are we are watching them for the blood glucose, and it, it will not increase the uh, blood glucose to levels that are uh, hazards that are that are dangerous. Okay, My, I usually use the dexamethasone dose in a dose of five to eight milligrams uh, for for the for the several reasons that we have mentioned. 
Another person is asking uh, about uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, he's wondering if there's a difference between CPAP and BiPAP as far as which one is better. Okay. According to the condition of the patient, we, the choice of the, to, to use CPAP or BiPAP, having pulmonary hypertension, for instance, uh, is he prolonged chronic obstructive lung disease? Uh, whatever the cause of the, the indication for non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Uh, in my practice, the, the patients who are chronic obstructive lung disease who are on pulmonary hypertension, more than 45 millimeter mercury pulmonary artery pressure, I usually uh, give them a chance on CPAP, uh, sorry, on BiPAP for four weeks at least with medical treatment after consulting the cardiologists uh, in order to optimize them for the operation. But, but there is definitely a difference between the CPAP and BiPAP. I use the CPAP or the positive pressure ventilation in pre-oxygenating many of my patients who, whose body mass index is more than 50 kilograms per square meter. These patients are better pre-oxygenated on CPAP. In the, the, in the slides that uh, we, have, uh, we haven't completed, uh, my, strategy, my strategy in ventilation starts by non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in these patients followed by intubation. After intubation, we recruit these patients. We recruit them either manually or mechanically by the ventilation using the driving pressure of 15 centimeter water. And uh, you know, it has its technique. Uh, intraoperatively at any incidence of reduction in the oxygen saturation, I usually re-recruit these patients. A PEEP is all through in, I, I define the optimum PEEP by the process of the stepladder increase in the, in the PEEP on the driving pressure. And lastly, after, uh, before extubation of these patients, I recruit these patients. Postoperatively, I return to the non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. All this is indicated in all patients with body mass index above 55 kilograms per second. Okay, there's been, is it, yes. Is it yes. Okay. There have been a couple of questions regarding magnesium. Number one, do you think um, magnesium has a role in these patients um, possibly to uh, decrease the use of narcotics and also the de to decrease the use of uh, re muscle relaxants? And then the other question is how, what would be the dose of the magnesium? Okay. Magnesium is one of the uh, uh, most important drugs that I use as an adjuvant or in the multimodal analgesia uh, practice uh, or in our uh, hospital. Um, the dose is uh, around 15 milligram per kg. It's around one gram uh, to be infused intraoperatively uh, with other analgesics. Uh, and I can increase this dose to 30 milligram per kg if the patient is also hypertensive or if the patient is an obstructive lung disease asthmatic patient. In these patients, they will benefit from the higher dose of magnesium, not only for the analgesia, but for the bronchodilation for the blood pressure control. There's another question uh, that is uh, asking about goal-directed fluid therapy. Is that uh, part of your ERAS protocol? Um, it's not part of my protocol that I use, but uh, in the studies that have used goal-directed fluid therapy, uh, all of the results were with the restrictive or the relatively restrictive fluid therapy strategy. Uh, I usually use a volume of at least one liter. My surgeons usually work in within one hour, one and a half hours. Finish all the operation. The operation time is one and a half hours maximum. So in the first hour, a one liter of crystalloid plus another 500, liter, 500 milliliters for the next half an hour uh, is enough 
to, uh, in order not to have a, a, a hypovolemic patient or a hypervolemic patient. But as a goal directed therapy using one of the transesophageal Doppler, no, it's not, in, it's not feasible in such patients because we use bougies uh, in, for, as a part of the surgery. The use of PICO and is too much for such a procedure. And it's, I, I don't think that it is highly indicated in such patients. The procedure is minimally invasive with minimal fluid shift. There was one question regarding regional uh, anesthesia. Uh, for instance, erector spinae block or maybe neuroaxial anesthesia. Are you using mm -hmm. that as part of your protocol? No, I, I, I actually uh, tried the intrathecal morphine. Intrathecal morphine, uh, small dose is 0.2 milligram intrathecally, uh, as recommended by Dr. Ahmed Osman from from Asif University because he is one of the uh, uh, bariatric anesthetists, I can tell, I can see that. Um, and it was very effective, but it's, it's too much for such a fast surgery. It, it doesn't take, and the pain is very well controlled with the uh, multimodal analgesia. I tried the, the tap lock, I tried the um, intercostal, and there is a study on the erector spinal pain block in obese patients from the growing bari bariatric surgery is now ongoing in, in our university. Uh, but all in all, the multimodal analgesia without epidurals is, can be done and is effective, and the patients, most of them are satisfied. One of the most effective Elements is the dexmedetomidine. Yes, there was Ideas. actually a question regarding the pre presidex. How are you using the dexmedetomidine? Is it pre, intra, or post operative? I started. I started intraoperative, um, all through the operation until the post operative period and discontinuity. No, 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 no need for dexmedetomidine post operative. It's just for the intraoperative period and its effect lasts for hours after the operation. Can you talk a little bit more about the carbohydrate loading in especially uh, in diabetic, diabetic patients? Do you have any concerns there? Yes, the, the on, and none of them has shown uh, elevation of blood sugar to more than 200 milligrams uh, per deciliter. Uh, from the uh, from this dose of carbohydrate loading that that is around 200 ml of clear uh, sugary fluid two hours before the operation do you use pca uh, in th these uh, procedures for post operative yes routinely nowadays routinely and i include in them um, uh, half of the opioid dose, I usually use nalbifen. Uh, I include a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, the, the ketorolac. I include dexamethasone and uh, some anti-emetic like ranicetron and a proton uh, pump inhibitor as a control lock. Uh, uh, omeprazole. How about um, some patients that are complaining of retrosternal chest pain um, that is hard to manage with opioids or NSAIDs? How do you manage the retrosternal chest pain? Sorry, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't hear the question. Okay. There are some patients that uh, complain uh, uh, of retrosternal chest pain in a post-op. Mm. Um, and That's this more, there are. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, this is mostly due to some sort of esophageal spasm or esophageal irritation from the traction during the operation or the excision of the part of the stomach and sleep gastrectomy. Uh, and you, I usually use uh, anticholinergics in such cases, or uh, like like bascopen, uh, uh, hyoscine. I mean, uh, it usually relieves some of the pain with the analgesia. Uh, but after excluding the cardiac cause, because it's very similar 
to the, the coronary syndrome. We exclude first the cardiac, then we give the uh, scopolamine for, for management of such pain. Um, there was one other question, one, uh, I think one last question a person asked about um, you mentioning that uh, dexa, uh, dexamethasone uh, causes or helps to relieve the stress response. And that person uh, mentioned that he thought that uh, steroids are actually stress hormones. So he wanted you to clarify that. Mm. By giving extrinsic steroid, we reduce the response of the patient to stress. We reduce the production of the stress hormones. And yani already we preempt the patient against the stress. That's why it's an anti-stress drug. It's a stress hormone, but it's an anti-stress drug. I believe I covered all the questions I could find. Okay. Thank you for, very much for your, for your excellent presentation and for your uh, efforts to answer uh, the many questions that we had. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, pleased to meet you in this uh, very nice course. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Dr. Farrow. Uh, perfect. Uh, I think at the end of this wonderful uh, day, uh, I would like to thank our uh, uh, elegant speakers, Professor Ansari, Professor Ashraf Tayyar, Professor Walid Hamimi, and uh, our moderator, Professor Webke. And I would like to extend my thanks to Dr. Saad Mahdi and the rest of the organizing committee. I'd like to thank all the attendees and I hope to see you again and again in the upcoming webinars. And thank you all. Thank, thank you very much for everybody uh, thank who you. participated in this international night. And is a great success for this tonight and one of the milestones of our webinar. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.